Right. So um, you've indicated that actually the law says that you should be seated 30 minutes of time. Anybody who comes in a minute after the paper has started should not be allowed in. Now, there are some of the situations where you may have to apply certain forms of mitigation. Um, I'm told that for some of the people, uh, there were health reasons. There were very good reasons for which they, they came in late. You know, so um, sometimes you have to apply a human face to some of these uh, uh, situations and so that you are not seen to be too draconian in, uh, you know, dealing with some of those cases. But then um, I hear in the case of Laboni in particular, unfortunately, I wasn't personally there. Mm. But the information reaching us indicates that these are, you know, perennial latecomers, you know, and so the headmistress was bent on ensuring that all the officials, let me put it that way, the officials there were bent on ensuring that these people were actually punished. They simply they, they did not go by the rules, and for them it was a deliberate action. So um, we have the law, yes, but then there are situations where, for example, I was somewhere where we had one boy who was uh, a, a sickler. He had sickled. It was very cold that morning, and they were walking to the examination center. was difficult. There was another who was coming from the sick bay, you know. So... For some of those situations, you may have to um, apply human faith. So maybe that is why it appears that there's a certain uh, amount of, uh, uh, you know, inconsistency with the application of the law. And actually, the law is, is specific on lateness to examination halls. So, 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 so therefore, the application of the law is left in the hands of the invigilator to interpret and say that because of your peculiar situation, even though the law says that you should be seated 30 minutes before the examination. Because of your situation, I may allow you some kind of compassionate you know, consideration. You know, we, have, we also have a situation where if you happen to allow somebody in like that, you should produce a report to indicate that and it is so and so came in late and these are the reasons for which they came in late. Then, as a council, we use our discretion to determine whether we could allow. So it is not about the vigilators or supervisors use their discretion, but then even if they do, they have to, uh, you know, refer to us so that we determine whether indeed the reasons they are assigning to whichever late comers uh, is tenable or not. Mm. Apart from the Osu Senior High and Laboni, have you gotten reports of similar situations across the country? Um, I, for now, I've heard only about one case in uh, Techiman. I think it's uh, Assam senior high or something where one boy was late for the second paper, the objective test, mm -hmm. and so was not permitted to go in there. Apart from that, uh, we haven't received any report. Maybe uh, our monitors on the ground are yet to submit such reports. And the arrests, update us on where it took place, which particular region and which school, if you have that information. Yeah, so we, we, we've had uh, arrests in uh, the Bono region. We've had arrests in the western region, central region, and also in the Volta region. These are the areas where we picked up some people who were, uh, you know, uh, engaged in some form of malpractice, uh, and so they had to be picked up by the police. Yeah. So, you know, six, or, 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 or we have more? Well, so far we've registered six. Maybe there are more that are yet to be reported to us, but then uh, after the close of uh, yesterday and even this morning when I monitored, our platform where the reports usually come, the number stands at six. And Mr. Paki, Mr. Kapi, which law did they violate, those who have been arrested? So um, there were some of them who that were picked up, I think, sometime last week during the um, um, ICT practical paper. They were answering the questions, uh, you know, and then with the intention of sending them in to be given to the candidates. Mm -hmm. Um, there was this particular one who was picked up in the course of the examination he had in his possession, uh, material that was relevant to the examination that was to be written at the time. There was somebody also who posed as an invigilator and was parading himself at the center. And when he was accosted, he could not actually uh, confirm that the supervisor denied knowing him. And when he was searched, they found material on him. So mm. these are the few incidents we've re recorded so far. So despite your appeal and caution, there appears to be uh, some teachers and invigilators who are bent on, you know, circumventing the rules and helping their, their, their students in the process. Yeah, you, you could say so, and that, that's a very sad situation. And, I mean, I don't know what else, or what else we have to do to 
get this thing under control to allow students to write the exam on their own strength because you had so many issues uh, during the BECE and the thinking was that people would take cue from it and yet we are experiencing this at this very level. Yeah, so um, going forward, we'd have to probably hold a stakeholders meeting. Already, there, are, there have been these thoughts about us being able to engage people. I mean, they should come on their own volition and offer to the late. We have a contract with them, and then we can fire them as and when we feel they are not abiding by the rules governing the examination. So, so um, basically, what we may have to do going forward is to be able to uh, recruit people independently and then you know make sure that they offer us assistance and they'll apply the rules as expected right but you would say that i mean six six cases reported across the country so generally you would say that everything is going smoothly well um these are reports that we've received uh it may be that where we've not been able to go to things are not going really right but um we are being optimistic that um people would uh you know apply reason to whatever they are doing and ensure that they are applied by the rules governing the exam. Be, be, before I let you go, I mean, this is a related matter. The NDC held a news conference last week saying that WIAC has suspended the marking of the BEC because of government indebtedness. I don't know whether you've been paid and the marking has resumed. Oh, well, um, we have, uh, you know, schedules for the post-examination activity, that is when they are done with the exam, what we do. Um, as we speak, the post-examination activities are ongoing. Uh, we have controlled the scripts. We, have, we are doing the swap right now, getting them across to the venues where they are going to be marked. Now, the, the reason for the delay is simply the fact that, you know, the time lapse between the completion of the BEC and the commencement of the, the WAS was such that there was no way uh, we could have marked the BEC because the same personnel who are monitoring the WAS who should be doing the marking of the BEC as far as the staff of White is concerned. Also, we have examiners who currently are vigilating supervising the WAS, and so we cannot take them out of the classrooms where they are vigilating and ask them to come to the marking. So basically, that is the reason for which the, the marking of the BEC has stalled. But as we speak, plans are far advanced. Come the 17th of September, We'll begin with the coordination between 17th and 21st of September. We'll do the coordination and then the actual uh, conference marking will begin. So, um, so far, we are still working on the BEC scripts. Yeah, so you are saying that the, the, the late start in marking the paper has nothing to do with government indebtedness? Oh, no. That does not mean that there's no, no, there's no outstanding payment to be made. There are still some money to be paid, but I, I'm just saying that the reason is not about money. But it's just about the personnel who are supposed to perform the duty. And you have assurance that everything will be paid before you finish marking? Oh, yeah. As at uh, last Thursday, my uh, uh, colleague, Director of Finance, was at the ministry to pick up a check for the marking of the BEC. And then we had also been asked to pick up uh, two checks for the WAS. I'm unable to confirm that those checks have been, uh, you know, uh, duly delivered to us. But then um, at least attempts have been made, and as and when, we're able to confirm that we'll, we'll certainly make you aware of it. All right, thank you very much. Mr. John Kapi is manager in charge of public relations with the West African Examination uh, Council. And the news this afternoon is that in the ongoing WASI, that's the West African Senior High School Certificate Examination, they have arrested six uh, teachers and invigilators. They were helping the students answer uh, some of the questions that they were saddled with today. And since I've been arrested, they've been handed over to the police for the police to process them for court. We'll follow this matter up keenly and bring you the very latest in subsequent bulletins. But let me take you to your election headquarters because the NDC flag bearer, John Mahama, has delivered a damning verdict on the MPP's flag bearer, Dr. Mama Dubaumi's recent media encounter, accusing him of spreading lies and delivering incoherent speech at the event. Speaking during his tour of the Greater Accra region, he further accused the MPP of harboring devious intentions saying their media engagement was an attempt to shift focus away from the NDC's manifesto launch. Start. We are going to launch our manifesto on the 24th of August. Immediately, our opponents 
announced that they were going to do a media encounter on the 25th of August, the very next day. You know, the intention for doing that media encounter the next day after we had announced our manifesto was to turn the attentions of Ghanaian from the NDC manifesto. That was the main reason that they decided to do a media encounter the very next day after we launched our manifesto. But you see, when you do something with devious intention, it backfires on you. When you do something with devious intention, it backfires on you. You know how to tell when somebody is lying. If there are people who are smooth talkers, who can speak ta -ta 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 like machine gun, the time when they become stammerous and they start stammering, you know they are lying. Somebody who can speak ta -ta 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 like AK-47, suddenly media encounter, I think, eh, 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 eh. The person started stammering, and you can't tell the head or tail. The fundamentals are weak, and then he went logoligi, 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 logoligi. And so, you must do things with truthful intention. And the basic principle of leadership is truth and honesty. Well, let's stay a little longer on the NDC because they're also calling for an urgent meeting with the Electoral Commission over what they describe as serious discrepancies and covered during the ongoing 2024 voter exhibition exercise. In a letter signed by the party's General Secretary Fifi Fiave Kwete, the NDC expressed concern about the inconsistencies between the provisional voter register provided by the Commission and the register currently being exhibited at the various centres. The party is urging for a straight resolution to these issues to ensure that the upcoming election are free, fair, and transparent. And we have a copy of that statement that they sent to the, to the EC, the letter, actually. The, so we bring you greetings from the NDC headquarters. Now, we write to request for an important emergency meeting with you and your team to discuss very serious discrepancies discovered during the ongoing 2024 voter exhibition exercise. And the letter goes on to say that the discrepancies emanate from the analysis of the provisional voter register given to S, that's the NDC, by the commission and register being exhibited at the centers. We anticipate a favorable and timely response as we work towards free, fair, and transparent elections. And this is the special letter the NDC delivered to the Office of the Electoral Commission uh, this uh, morning, requesting an urgent meeting. Remember that the voter, the voter exhibition exercise is ending today. Deputy General Secretary of the party, Mustafa Bande, says the meeting is necessary as the party casts doubt on the AC's ability to organize a free, fair, and transparent election in December. Few, few fundamental data discrepancies in terms of the registration that we have done and also the provisional voter register that was given to political parties. And then what has been provided or what is being used by the commission itself are the various exhibition centers that are ongoing. And these discrepancies goes to the root of the credibility of the exercise that we are undertaking. Um, we have decided that the electoral commission is an institution and the first step, let us request a meeting. Let the commission avail itself and the presence of other political parties who equally have interest mm. so that these matters can first be addressed by the commission because obviously the commission is the institution responsible for everything that is about election registers and everything so for the benefit of the doubt we think that is appropriate that the commission would be briefed on some of the particulars of the issues before we hit to public so that 
uh, in the event that the commission is not able to deal with it, then we can open up. But in the meantime, I can refer you to um, some other ancillary issues such as what has happened in Tamale, where people are being transferred from one constituency to the other without from Tamale South precisely to Pusiga constituency. So it's not even adjoining constituencies, it's, it's it. another region. Pusiga and Tamale are very far. Mm -hmm. And so how did we get to a place where people and their data is being transferred when they, they haven't actually applied for transfer? So these matters are very serious issues, including, uh, like I said, huge discoveries, fundamental discoveries of discrepancies that the Electoral Commission should be able to address if the, the IPAC meeting so this was this morning uh, on news decks on joy news now what is the latest on it as the ec responded to the electoral to the ndc dr rashid tanko is deputy director of elections with the ndc and he joins me via phone for us to get a very latest on this matter uh, dr tanko computer thank you very much for your time this afternoon you're already on the poll do you have a response from the electoral commission you say good afternoon to your chairman viewers my brother, as we speak now, the Electoral Commission has not responded yet. Uh, we are still waiting for their response uh, so that we can go and have these discussions with them over the, the serious discrepancies that we have found in the Provisional Voter Register as displayed at the exhibition center and the one given to us. So what has to the discrepancies that you, you say require this emergency meeting? In fact, it, it, it boils down to the heartbeat of the whole register itself. Mm. Uh, because the register, as we speak now, the EC is not telling us the total registered figures. I remember the other time you interviewed my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yes, yeah, so he was mentioning some, uh, some figures. And then uh, you put them together and it was giving us almost uh, an 18 million, 700,000 plus, right? Yes. Uh, but if you look at their last statement, when they were about to do the exhibition, they mentioned some uh, 18 million 681,000. So you see that they are not even too sure of the figures themselves as they put out publicly. And secondly, when we look at the exhibition, the exhibited register, there's zero discrepancy in terms of figures, and, 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 and then the numbers are crossed. Some have doubled, some there are shortfalls in, in, the, in the constituencies. Some transfers have, have quadrupled, unprecedented. We've never seen that kind of transfer. Mm. And then so all these things goes to the heartbeat of the register itself. And we need to have an encounter with them. So, so Dr. is this nationwide or restricted to certain areas? In, in fact, it's across. It was, it, it's not specific. It's across. Because if you look at it, it cuts across from the northern region, upper east, upper west, Bono regions, and even Ashanti region, a substantial number of them, where we have these challenges that we want them to take a look at it, mm. especially this transfers matter, the way they have, the data has been moved. I, I mean, it, 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 it beats our imagination. Why should they have an IT department that they, 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 they are always saying that it's one of the best, but always chaining out one of the substandard data that we can always think of? Because this one doesn't make sense to anybody. And so from your own... Migrating uh, four data together mm -hmm. to have a composite register, and yet we are having this challenge. It, it, it's unheard of. So, 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 Doctor, from your own analysis, what could, be, what could be responsible for this challenge that you have identified? That is why we want to meet them, because they should be able to tell us what is responsible for this challenge, because it's their own data. The data that we are talking about is from them. They gave us the PVR, and they display the registers for, for the exhibition purpose. Mm. And then people go there to check their names and they are seeing discrepancies. They are saying, I have not asked for any transfer and I've been transferred. I have not moved from one place to another and you have moved. Me. Where from that? So these are the things we want them to find out. They should be able to tell us uh, what has caused all this. And then how are they going to make sure that all these things are put back in, 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 into order before we go to uh, December 7th? So currently, with, with what you have witnessed, I mean, yes. is it you understand them that if yes. these errors are not corrected, it will compromise the integrity of the register? Completely. In fact, if these errors are not corrected, of the register mm. is 
is, is, is highly ineffective. It cannot be used for any purpose. It's, it's sick. And I can describe it as a crime scene mm. because it bedeviled with a lot of discrepancies that you cannot be used. You can even think of talking of free, fair, transparent, credible election with this type of register. It's completely sick. And we know that the, the exercise itself, the exhibition, is ending today. So beyond today, you think that you can rectify it, and then what avenue would there be available to, to, to ensure that, I mean, after going through the process of rectifying whatever errors that exist now, we'll be fine-tuned such that on December 7th, the right register will be what people will go and check their names. Uh, well, that is why we, as a political party, the NDC, also the view that if they can even extend the exhibition for additional days, at least from three, four days, because now people are now getting to understand that the register, there's a problem, they have to rush and go and check their names. Mm. Because if you use their short code, the short code is given a different data. You go to the registration, uh, the exhibition center, and you have a different information too. So if you're even going to rely on the short code, the short code is even more faulty than even what they've exhibited. Because I can imagine using the short code and you give me a data that is different from my ID card, mm. the one I'm having. And I use the same ID card for voting during the 2020. And now this ID card, I've used your short code and it's giving me a different uh, uh, data altogether. And so it is important that they should allow some time for people. Now people are now awakening and they now realize that, hey, this issue is mysterious. Because the, the issue of family yesterday mm. has reawakened people uh, now that they should have to run, rush and go and check their names in the register. Because, for instance, my brother, you are sitting here. I don't know whether you've gone to check your name or not. I, it I, could be that your name has been sent to Abunkurgu uh, Yunyu. You are not aware if you haven't gone to check and you think that because you voted in 2020, your name is intact, you have your ID card. If you don't go and check, these people would have sent your name somewhere. In fact, I, I, I use a short code to check. I mean, what. Uh, I will advise you to go and check the main register itself, the mm -hmm. one display. Right. A so, good friend of mine used the short code. Mm -hmm. The information he had on it was not correct. We advise that you should go to the exhibition center and recheck. When you went to the exhibition center, interestingly enough, the name in the exhibited register was correct. But the, the short code was given a different data. So you see that when he started, uh, he, he was a bit mad. We told him, don't be mad. There are two things. Either the short code or you go to the main one. Because these people, we can't trust them. The IT department is, is a crime scene and it needs to be exercised. If we don't exercise their, their IT department, this problem will continue. That, 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 and that's the one they check. Mm -hmm. it, it, it really, he saw the differences. And so he was advising his department people that, hey, my brothers, you have to go and check. Oh, don't rely on the short code because the short code is giving you a different information. Uh, Dr. Dr. Tengu, let me ask a final question on this matter because I know that in the areas that you identify these lapses, I mean, the EC, the EC, I don't know whether your agents drew the attention of the Electoral Commission officer there and the response that the agent got. Uh, well, you see, if you even draw the attention of the Electoral Commission there, they cannot do it because, you know, per exhibition, it is when corrections and then objections and inclusions are filled by the people by themselves, mm. the person who is looking for it. For instance, if I go there and see a problem with my name, I can request for a uh, uh, correction or inclusion or objection. Right. Okay? Fine. But when, when it comes to issues of correction and inclusion, an agent cannot just do it there. He cannot correct it himself. He can only escalate it to us. Mm -hmm. So that we will take it out. Because if the person does not come to check himself, he cannot stand there and say, okay, I've seen a mistake in this, uh, in this your data here. Correct it there. That is not his business. Are you getting it? Right. So that is why they have escalated all these problems they have seen. Because we don't forget, we have given them the PVRs. We have printed to our agents. They have, they have it. They also compare what they are seeing there. Mm. And they'll be able to tease out all these discrepancies for it. And that is why we have written to them. In fact, a lot of them, we don't want to discuss it publicly as of now. Mm. Because we think that the right forum for this discussion is the Electoral Commission. Right. And that is why we have written to them that we are asking for this emergency meeting. But we're going to sit with them. We give it to them. It's your data. This is what we have seen in your data. Try to resolve that data. Before we go to adjudication, we know that we are going to have adjudication. Mm. But we need to solve this one because we adjudication. A report will have to come to us before we, we adjudicate it. But we, if we don't I, know I this, ask, they bring us an, a report to adjudicate. 
Dr. Yeah, I, 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 asked, I asked that question because I know that the essence of the voters' exhibition is to look at whether everything is okay, and if there are errors, how do we deal with it? The Electoral Committee will then have to now correct whatever errors that may arise out of the exhibition exercise. And so the expectation is that when these errors are pointed out to them by your agents, they will take steps to correct them. So I'm asking uh, the necessity of this meeting, if the exercise itself was to look at whether everything is fine, if everything is not fine, how then you deal with it? And then we we'll go, we'll go to the drawing board and have it done and then present it to you again. That is why I'm saying that. Because, for instance, the 23 names, uh, the, 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 the 32 or so names that were uh, discovered in Northern Region mm -hmm. haven't been transferred illegally from Tamale South all the way to Pusiga. These people, just a few of them went to check their names and realized that their names have been transferred. Without, so without, a good without, number without of them have not gone to check about. their names. Mm. And now, now that those people have not gone, and we have been able to look at it, look at the register, and realize that, hey, these names have been moved, these names have been moved, these names are not there, they have been taken out from the register. Right. That is why we have put them together and want to meet the electoral commission and present it to them. So, so that for this correction, because if we haven't pointed out, the EC wouldn't have known this, because they brought that in this. Right. So, 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 and so, that is so, why so, we so want to meet them meeting, and present those things to them. This meeting we are requesting, are you doing so under the auspices of IPAC, or just the NDC alone wanting to meet the EC? Well, we have written, we have seen, we have just, uh, studied the PVR given to us. And then so our general secretary has written to them. It's at the behest of our national executive committee. We have discussed it and think that, look, the right forum for this matter is a election to discuss it. So that is why we have written to them. Other political parties may take out, I don't know whether they are also studying the register or not. Uh, that, is, that one is left to them. But we are, in our site, our IT department, we have taken time to study the register. And we have seen these serious discrepancies, which has rendered the, the, the register a very sick register that cannot be used for purpose until all these discrepancies are resolved. All right. Thank you so much for your time. This afternoon, Dr. Rashid Tanko, Computer, is Deputy Director of Elections with the National Democratic Congress here in DC. And they say that they have identified so many errors with the ongoing voter exhibition exercise, which is actually ending today. And they requested an emergency meeting with the Electoral Commission to try and see how best they can resolve uh, these matters. Well, let's move away from politics and hopefully do more politics uh, as we move on on the polls this afternoon and talk about another very important subject, and that is illegal mining. Now, the information we are picking this afternoon is that an unidentified miner has invaded the Drua River Forest, uh, one of Ghana's major protected forests, at Jura Bonso in Enzima East District of the Western Region, in what could mark uh, the beginning of a chain of forest degradation through illegal mining. Part of the forest has been cleared and excavators moved to site ready for operation. Management of Better Ghana Services, legal owners of the concession in the forest, has denied knowledge of the invasion. A Rastas Ayodonko went on the ground to assess the situation, and this is what he found. Some of Ghana's quality forest reserves have in recent times been attacked and destroyed illegally for gold. Powerful individuals, including politically exposed persons, have turned reserved forests like Apawasa and Apamprama into miles of useless pits and gullies. The Draw River Forest Reserve is perhaps next in line. It is a protected area located in the western region of Ghana, established in 1954. It covers an area of approximately 52,800 hectares. The Draw River Forest Reserve is now under siege. We are in the middle of a very rich, dense forest which has been standing. It's called the Draw River Forest Reserve. It's been around four centuries, named after this beautiful river flowing through the forest. And it's within the Inzema East municipality of the Western region. Now, we are learning that this forest, a part of it, has been given to Betterland Ghana Limited for mining. And we are here to find out who has started doing exploration services and 
clearing the forest for mining. Typical of the start of the destruction of other forests, the miners have initiated test protocols, cleared portions of the forest, and are in the process of transporting excavators and cabins into the forest for the start of an onslaught. This farmer, a native of Jurabanso, speaks of the value of this green ancient resource. 1974 to 1975, I from Asasi Tree to Banso. Road in so by and I'm investors by by waiting by the royalties back and my cronos so two pong. Of course, Tim Banono and Ma and Masika also in your be at the Bois Crono. Now we to two as here now say no cry. Sign she mouth on air banno. Yeah, you know, you're a bit school. You are our child, you are a child home. No, no, so when you be a cry, no, they are taught at the end. He echoes the resolve of the youth to protect the forest, asking government to act. Media, the American church, by informing that on my own, say, even your president to crack as a fallacy, the Obama home by the CIA, who say, and the Amria, or move you sooner, and I do dunk a coffee, I do dean, they best say a fallacy, no, the American church, and a coffee. President our Ghana say, only seen it now from near draw for less in Omaha by my. Legally, portions of the Draw River Forest Reserve have been awarded to Better Land Limited for mining, but they have denied any claims to the current invasion of the forest. Many of the forest reserves that have been degraded, Apamprama, Apawasa, started like this. A clearing testing for minerals, and before you realize, excavators are in there and the whole place is gone. For now, we do not know who has started this within the Draw River Forest Reserve. We demand answers. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Draw River Forest Reserve in Zima East Western Region. Right, let me bring in a Rasus Asari Donko who uh, brought us this uh, feature from the Western region. Also, we'll be speaking to Aula Sewa, our coordinator of Eco Consciousness. But let me ask Erasmus first. Erasmus, so do you have the answers you asked? Well, uh, there are interesting developments from the Draw River Forest Preserve. In fact, when we went in there, we had information that the permit has been given to Betterland Ghana Limited for uh, exploration purposes. Mm. Now, we found out from Betterland, they are saying that they are not the ones who are currently in the forest uh, clearing the area and starting mining operations. Mm. They are not the ones, so they are not responsible for that. But we have information from the Forestry Commission indicating otherwise that uh, they have given uh, better land uh, entry, and, and so they think that they are the ones who are operating there. So we will try and get Erasmus back on the line. There appears to be internet connection challenge there. Erasmus, I don't know whether you, you can hear me, otherwise I'll move to Awula Sewa, coordinator for Echo Consciousness. Awula, so good afternoon, welcome. We will never, we will never move away from this subject. I don't know what you make of what you are learning that a forest reserve uh, entry permit granted better ghana mining services limited they say that they are, they are yet to undertake the exercise yet there is a, a degraded area that we do not know who is responsible for this for me all i'll say is that the firefighters are the arsonists you have li 2462 which allows mining in forest reserves including globally significant biodiversity areas, mm. like the Draw River Forest Reserve, which was a mine protected area in 1954, who in his right sense would issue entry permits to go there. So what we are saying is that all activists should come together. This is a crime. This is a crime. It's um, environmental vandalism. But we should get the withdrawal of LI2462. And all the political parties, shame on them. I don't see anything in their manifesto that says that they'll get rid of LI2462, which is permitting this mayhem. 
We look at a place like Atronsu in the north, uh, western north region. The excavators are there. They are destroying the farmland. They are also destroying the once pristine Atronsu stream. We have contacted the um, uh, regional minister, mm. Jojo uh, Obeying, right. and he has done nothing. The devastation is still going on. So we can see that there's no interest in protecting our forest reserves. An absolute shame on those in authority. So basically, you are even against the granting of this uh, license to Better Mining Company to undertake this, you know, legalized mining in this forest there reserve. Was a, of course. How can you give a license to go to a forest reserve? It is a globally significant biodiversity area. For heaven's sake, you do not have entry there to go and log or mine. It is a globally significant biodiversity area. The same as Atiwa Forest. You don't give people licenses to go there. But to circumvent all this, they are fast LI Parliament has passed LI 2462, mm. which allows mining in forest reserves. So that law should be withdrawn. And right now, I hope President Nana Kufado is listening. He put his presidency on the line. They should move the necessary forces there and stop the mayhem that is going on because it's going to destroy all of us. Ghana Water Company is talking about not being able to uh, uh, purify the water Absolutely. because of Galamse. Mm. And we are sitting there allowing our forests to be destroyed. Do we have a government? Do we have a government in place? I'll come back to you as we wrap up this. But let me go back to Erasmus, who, who has done this work. And Erasmus, again, if it is not better Ghana, then what name are you learning on the grounds? I'm, I'm getting various uh, explanations from certain key areas. Mm. One, there is a company um, that says that it has been contracted to do exploration for another. Um, that Better Land Services is saying that they don't know this company, they don't know of uh, whoever is doing that activity within the forest, is alien to them. Mm. And so I think the Mineral Commission should own up and come to us and tell us who has invaded the forest. So, Erasmus, if it is not Better Land, is it, is it even though Better Land has the right to this concession and somebody else is undertaking... Uh, somebody is degrading the forest. So better Ghana is just helpless. There's nothing they can do uh, to say that you've invaded our concession and for that reason, uh, you should be arrested or held responsible. The company that has given, that has given the legal right to mine is helpless in this situation. Is that what it is? And I, I think that they have a responsibility. Once you are the concession owner, if it falls directly within your concession, you're supposed to protect exactly. your concession. And exactly. So, uh, they, they cannot uh, be absolved of blame. They have to go in there and try to protect their concession and, and, and protect the forest in doing so. What about the District Security Council, the regional minister and the, and the RECSEC? Are they also not aware of what is going on in the forest? They cannot ever say they are not aware. The Forestry Commission cannot be absolved of blame. Uh, Mr. Brown and his people uh, can identify somebody who goes in to even cut a pistol. And they know who enters the forest at what given time. So they cannot say that they are not aware of this entry and they, they do not know who is responsible for it, whether legal or illegal. So I think that it's high time that the Mineral Commission starts to uh, stop hiding behind uh, some of these things, publicity, and come out directly to tell Ghanaians what they are doing to protect uh, uh, the forest. And that, after all, that is their mandate. They should be able to tell us who has entered the forest, mm. uh, on what basis have they entered the forest, what are they doing, what are their permits, what are their limits, what, where and where have they been allowed to do so, so that we can all be uh, protectors of this natural resource. And, and in fact, this tells me one thing, either we are helpless in protecting our own forests, or there are big shots behind the people who can undertake this exercise in the full glare of people around and feel that nobody can do anything to them. Well, uh, and uh, uh, Elton, it is interesting to note that I have seen similar instances where the concession has been given to somebody, but the connivance of the Forestry Commission officials and some other key institutions they get other people to go around and start right. degrading the forest mm. and mining illegally behind the law. 
Mm. I have seen it in so many places. Mm. I hope this is not one of them. Mm. But we have to seriously engage it. We cannot mind haphazardly like that as right. if there is no law. Right. There are laws binding what we do. Uh, in, in, in certain key areas of our economy. Before I let you go so that I can bring in Aula, uh, the Asantehene has also distilled some chiefs in the Sabronum area, the Jasangene and the chief linguist. Can you give us an update on this? Well, so um, yesterday, Otunfo invited them, and you know there's a chief chieftaincy issue there, so it's before Otunfo, mm -hmm. but he did not even go into that. He went straight into the fact that he has been notified that these three key chiefs uh, in the area have been doing, uh, engaged in illegal mining. They, their roles in the illegal mining that is going on uh, is, is, is real. They have uh, tasked the uh, NIB to investigate. They've given reports of their involvement, mm. the amounts that they have paid to illegal miners and all that. And that is why he distilled them and warned them that even as he has distilled them, if they try anything funny, he will get the security agencies to arrest them. All right. Eras is Uncle. Thank you so much for this update. Let me get the final words from Aula. So, Aula, I mean, they, going forward, and if I look at the bigger picture, you, 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 you've made it clear that you are waiting to hear a very definite statement on how the two political parties intend to deal with legal mining going into 2025, because we have two individuals who are seeking to lead the, the country, and this is a very important matter. Somebody says that all of them should leave the Forest Reserve because if they don't, and in the event that you win the elections, we will and work them out of the forest. There's another person saying that, I will empower you. I will empower small-scale miners. I will even dedicate a bank to give them loans so that they can, they can undertake uh, safe mining. I mean, the two, the two proposals going to 2025, are these the proposal we need to end this menace once and for all? They're in our heads. We don't understand that uh, destroying our forests, our forests, our lands. Eco-conscious citizens and all right-thinking Ghanaians are saying, withdraw LI 2462. Mm. We cannot go and mine or log in forest reserves. When you have the head of forestry commission saying that he has no uh, objections to mining, you know that he can't be there protecting the forest. Mm. So we are saying that all these are red herrings. Whether it's better life. Whether I don't care who is there. Nobody should be there at all. Forest reserves are not for mining. And when you have a globally significant biodiversity area, what is anybody exploring for? Mm. We should kick out everybody from the forest reserve, cordon the place, and say that we care about the lives of Ghanaians. When you destroy your forest and you destroy the ecosystem, what do you think is going to happen to you? Mm. What do you think is going to happen to you? It's like we don't understand the importance of forests and of our water bodies. Because you have a river there, you are going to pollute it, just as you polluted the Atronso stream, mm. while the regional minister stands idly by and does absolutely nothing and gives credence to the rumor that highly placed persons are behind. Right, Aula, let me leave it here. Uh, that's Aula Sewa with Eco Conscious Citizens, an NGO that's dedicated to protecting our forest reserve against illegal mining. This is a pause here on Joy News. Get interactive with us. We are live on Facebook. We are live on X. We are live on YouTube and of course myjoyonline.com. We will take a short break. When we will come back, we've got a very interesting conversation about the upcoming Ugwa Afetu Afashe this weekend. Stay put. Well, we're going to end it here for today because we've got a very exciting conversation coming up. But there's so much stories on myjoyonline.com. Uh, if you should visit there, stories we have uh, Mahama and of course taking on the Vice President Dr. Mahama Dubaomiya. There's also an update on the fire uh, at Parliament House uh, this morning plus other stories making uh, the page on my jaw online. Daughter. Now as, as the excitement builds towards the CCF Ogwa Fetu Afashe celebration this September, the Ogwa Hene Osabare Ma Dr. Kwesi Ata II sat with Super Morning Show host Kojo Yansen for an exclusive interview he shared the highlights of his 25th, 25-year reign, exploring some of the often secret aspects of the traditional leadership, the role of chiefs in modern society, and the significance of the double celebration that has focused the eyes of the world on the city of first, Cape Coast. And so that is coming up pretty shortly. But for now, that's it for today. Whatever you are up to in the hours ahead, I hope it's profitable. My name is Elton Bobes. Tomorrow, same time, I'll be here with another exciting edition of the post, but I'll leave you in the hands of Kojo Yansem for that exciting conversation 
with Osaba Emakwesi Atta II. Thank you so much for having us, Osaba Emakwesi You're welcome. 25 years on the throne. Um, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. It must, uh, it must fill you with memories uh, of this, uh, you know, 25 year reign. What would you say are the highlights of this time that you've spent as uh, Omanhin? Yeah, I have uh, mixed feelings of the years, the 25 years. Some are good, some are not so turbulent. Hmm. What has happened is that uh, I'm glad there is still peace in Cape Coast. I've been able to maintain that peace, which is a precursor for developments, and that is uh, what I'm happy about. The other side of it is, you know, chieftaincy problems, I wasn't an exception. I've been in and out of court for, I would say, 23 years. It was just recently that I came out with the uh, Supreme Court saying that legitimately I was the uh, Omahin. After so, 23 years? After 23 years. By wow. the grace of God, I've been able to survive that. Did that affect your ability to reign? In a way, you ask yourself whether it was really worth uh, this position which your elders have placed on you. But then you tell yourself that uh, you can do it irrespective of what the circumstances may be. So that has, in fact, uh, pushed me on to, to be here uh, where I am now. So you've talked about one of your major achievements, which is the maintenance of peace in your traditional area. How did you do that? Uh, I see myself as, as one of the ordinary people in Cape Coast. When it comes to Brofu, I abaka Brofu. <laughs> when it comes to Fante, I abaka Fante. When it comes to displaying your skills as a, a joker, <laughs> so, so that people don't see you as a, a chrao hododo. Mm. So whatever and whoever comes to me, I try to meet them at that level. So it's easier for them to understand me and me to understand them. And that is perhaps one of the reasons why they uh, things are what they are now. If you had been asked to predict how your, 25, your first 25 years on the throne would go, would you have been able to predict this journey? Or has it all been quite a surprise to you? <laughs> you see, when you are not involved, you think it's all rosy. But when you get into it, and then you ask yourself, <laughs> it hasn't been easy. It has not been easy at all. Even when, when you try to do what is best for your people, you get one or two people criticizing you. So if you don't have that courage to persist, you will fail. And perhaps by the grace of God, I've been able to withstand all these pressures. And that is why I'm still here. Let's go back to the beginning. The very first time you realized that you are most likely the next leader of the Ugwa traditional area. Were, were you aware that it was coming or did they catch you by surprise okay. as it often happens to, to chiefs? Well, it, it happened all of a sudden. I have this uncle, we call Uncle Bayo, who, who has been very close to me and he named all my children when they were born, called me one day 
uh, from Accra. He was in Cape Coast. So I came to Cape Coast and the question the, my uncle popped to me was, Nana, to which he wanted to give me, uh, assign a duty for me, will I oblige and, and do it? I said, Uncle, how can I refuse you when you ask me to do anything? And that started the journey. He jumped into my car and we went around Cape Coast. He knew the elders he had to consult. And that was uh, the beginning. The first day that it was a Saturday, we went around about four elders. I went back to Accra, came back the following day. We did the same exercise. And then after about two or three such rounds, the whole elders called me and four others who were also eligible to meet with them. It was like an interview, being interviewed for a job. Wow. We were joined by about four, about six elders, yes. The first day we went through, we had to come it went on about three times. So every weekend I had to come from Accra, be part of the interview. And then after that first round with the elders, they sent us to the Oman, that is the Esupifu of Cape Coast. The leaders of the Asafu. The, the leaders of the Asafu groups, mm -hmm. that's seven of them. So, there again, we were subjected to interviews and at the end of it all, they chose me and a day was fixed for my internment and whatever had to do with it. And I came when I was asked to. They did whatever they had to do traditionally. Mm and was put in indoors and I was taught a few things. After one week, I was outdoored, went to a very, uh, prominent place of meeting for uh, Cape Coasters and I undertook the oath and that is how I became the chief. Wow. So it was actually a performance-based process with interviews. Yes, because we had four, uh, five gates at the time. And each gate, except one, which is the uh, gate for the Queen Mother. Mm. So the four gates each had to present a candidate. Right. And they had to, the elders had to select out of the four who they thought was fit enough for the, for the uh, position. Why do you think they chose you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Hmm. Perhaps they were looking for somebody who will represent them. Uh, it was just like an election. They asked a few questions about who you are, what you want Cape Coast to become, and uh, how you will treat your people, and ask whether there are certain things which it's only the prerogative of the paramount chiefs to do. Uh -huh. Will you be able to do that? I said yes. So perhaps hmm. that, that is what uh, convinced, convinced them that them. I, I'll, I'll be the right person for the post. And did they talk about any perks of the job? Did they talk about, you know, uh, a remuneration or a wage or anything like that? It's amazing that they did not. And I, I, I regret not asking them. They didn't <laughs> say anything about pegs, salary, or, and I didn't also ask. But uh, in this world, it's not everything that one should ask payment for. 
the good deeds you perform to others. That alone is enough or even better than uh, financial reward. Before this, you, you were an accountant. Is that correct? Yes. Where, where, where did you work? Mm. <laughs> I, I am a chartered accountant. Yeah. In, fact, I, in those days, it was certified accountant, mm. ACCA. I started my education at uh, Akimoda. My father was a school teacher, mm. government school teacher. So he was being transferred from one place to the other. And that's where I started in 1946. Right. Class one, class two, he was transferred to Kibi. Okay. Uh, so I went there, class three, class four, and then eventually we came to Cape Coast, Governor Boys School. There, two, three years later, I sat for the common entrance and I went to Atisada College. After that... Which year was this? 54. Wow. In fact, 53, the, uh, I finished, I, I went to Atisada in 54. Mm -hmm. Finished my secondary in 58. Applied to KNUST, mm -hmm. to the Commerce Department, to be trained as a, an accountant in 1960. But then in that particular year, the Commerce Department was moved from Kumasi to Achimota. Oh. So I was among the first to be there and joined with the continuous students from Kumasi. I see. So that was where I started my accountancy training. Two years, three years later, I qualified as uh, an intermediate. Not qualified, I, I mm. passed my intermediate examination. Right. But then, in those days, one had to acquire the practical experience as well. So I started graduate with the internal revenue. Mm -hmm. It was there that the government offered those of us who had uh, intermediate scholarships to go to the UK to continue the education. We were about five of us. I went to Glasgow, in Scotland, mm -hmm. and I stayed there for five years. I qualified and worked one year at Scotland, mm -hmm. and eventually came back to uh, IRS as uh, uh, an investigating accountant. Investigating accountant? An accountant. Wow. Then later on, uh, I transferred to Deloitte and Touche. Uh, Deloitte is one of the best, uh, six biggest uh, accountancy firms in the world. In the world. Mm. So I was privileged to mm. work with them to the extent that I even became a partner. Wow. After 13 years. I resigned, went to Bankwazi as the chief internal auditor, and from there to Weiss and Freitag, a German construction company. Mm. And it was there that suddenly I was asked to come and, and be the uh, paramount chief of Cape Coast after yeah. this uh, interviews and whatnot. So yeah. Eventually, I had to resign and become a full-time uh, paramount chief. Do you miss it, professional life? I do. But then, I feel this is a bigger responsibility than, than being there. Yeah. Was it a culture shock when you became the paramount chief? Did you suddenly find that things that you used to be able to do quite easily as a civilian. <laughs> I, I must no say that, possible. you see, we all have friends. And when we meet as friends, a few unspoken words uh, uh, come, come up. Yeah. We joke, we drink, we do all sorts of things. Unfortunately, this time I cannot do that. 
You may think it is a restriction of your movements, but then as a leader, you must set an example for your people to see you in that light. Because you mount a stage, talk to your people to be of good behavior. And you, if you yourself are not showing that character to them, you will fail. So as a chief, one has to comport themselves and be a good example for your people. And I had necessarily had to change and, and be as a, a role model for my people. Did you ever catch yourself slipping every now and then? Oh, occasionally, when you meet your friends, you are tempted <laughs> to do certain things, but then you immediately check yourself and, and do what is right. What other restrictions come with, with being the Paramount Chief? Oh, you cannot eat in public, drink in public, your private life, even at home, you must comport yourself, even with your family. Behave like a father to everybody. You must not present people. If everybody came to you, you must necessarily listen to them. You may not agree with everything they come and tell you, but then give a listening ear to your people. And they must, it's, it's like a father to everybody. Your sons and daughters must feel free to come to you. But then we have people, sub chiefs, Mochiami, and who help you in listening to uh, complaints or whatever people have to come and tell you. What would a typical day be like? What would you say are your mm -hmm. daily duties, Monday to Friday, as Paramount Chief? It's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. You cannot specify that maybe in the morning you have to do. Unless when you have an engagement, that one you have a time for it. You attend that engagement. Fine, but then on, the, on a normal day, people will come to you. You can set your own, maybe, program that in the morning you will have to listen to people, you have to attend meetings, and that. But if there is an emergency, as a father, you cannot refuse to attend that emergency. So your, your days are cannot be strictly according to a, a programmed uh, sort of uh, way of life. Now, in political leadership, presidents are just as, you know, uh, busy and they have such a big responsibility on them, just like paramount chiefs. And they have some, of, some similar problems as well, like having to deal with corruption and so forth. Is it the same? It is. Because if you are corrupt, you cannot check your people who are misbehaving. They will point their fingers at you. I worry to them, never correct them. So we must be of good behavior so we can look after our people and check our people when they misbehave. Do you ever have to do that? Have you ever had to do that? Oh, I've had on a few court? occasions, not correction. But those who misbehaved, mm. we had to apply the uh, uh, prescription for that. Mm. Have you ever had to disdo a minor chief or two? Suspension, yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. What would you say is the toughest part of your job? Lack of resources. Chiefs. We, we are there to make sure that there's progress. But it is difficult, especially with these days when things are very hard to come by. It becomes <clears throat> difficult to organize and, and to administer 
your own territory. That, that is why we, we are supported occasionally by the government, but that is not enough. You cannot do anything with, with that. You can appeal to your people, but especially in Cape Coast where the industries here are not that many, those who can afford to support are not that much. So there's a few, yes, but not as, as one would expect. What, 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 what are some of the aspects of your job that you wish you had more resources to do? You look around and see people, especially children, who are supposed to go to school, but for a lack of funding from their parents, it's not happening. And you as a parent, you owe that responsibility to make sure that all children go to school for the future development of the, of the country. And if you don't have that resources, uh, it's, it's a bit disturbing. So this, and also facilities. And, and the, the Metro Assembly <coughs> helps. Mm. But there again, they don't have that much to go around everybody. And you as a chief must also look for some uh, finance support to, to augment what uh, the Metro Assembly can do. How would you describe your relationship as Paramount Chief with the political leadership, whether state level or regional level? How would you describe your relationship with them? Do they work well with you? Do they rely on you for certain aspects of governance? How is that relationship? I mean, we are partners, irrespective of what party is in power. Or not. We are supposed to be partners. The party in power, together with the uh, chiefs, are all partners to develop the whole country. And we being part of the country are supposed to be in good terms with all uh, parties. So that one can rely on them and they can also, when they seek your support, can also give it back to them. And, and for you, that relationship has worked well? Oh yes, I, I'm there with, I'm friends with everybody including party, uh, activists, everybody. You cannot go against or not be free with, with no. Mm. So let's talk a bit about Fetu Afashe. Yeah. The 60th celebration of its re-emergence mm -hmm. is coming up. Mm -hmm. And it seems the whole country is excited about it. Utumfo Setutu is coming and uh, he uh, quite famously agreed within seconds of receiving the, the invitation. That must have pleased you greatly. I'm very glad that he has accepted to, to come. I've been bothering him over the years, but any time I asked that question. There would have been an earlier invitation somewhere else. But this year, I was fortunate that uh, at the time for, of the festival, he was free. So he gladly accepted to, to come. And I'm eagerly waiting for him uh, to be here. As a result of that, the, the enthusiasm for this year's activity is, is, is overwhelming. Everybody wants to be part of, of the Fetu Afashe Festival. And we are warming ourselves to welcome everybody to Cape Coast. So I will use this platform to invite everybody to come to Cape Coast, enjoy themselves, and see how Cape Coast is. We are the first in everything. Uh, 
the legal uh, the court started in Cape Coast. The formal education, government boys' school, started in Cape Coast. The first Methodist church is in Cape Coast. Almost the first in Cape Coast. So we want to step up that to do more and stay at the top. You know, everybody loves their hometown. Yes. But Cape Coast is obviously very special to you. If you had to explain why Cape Coast is so special to someone who has never been here before, what would you say? Cape Coast, we are friendly. We are friendly. I say, I can't. No, I'm sure you are. Maybe by you. And so, and our cuisine. Our, our ladies know how to cook. <laughs> Somebody some time ago described uh, uh, the way our ladies cook that. You have been on point of Mozambique was a good <laughs> Special. Mm -hmm. People are friendly. And also because of the historical, uh, the castle is here, the forts are here, the schools are That endears people uh, to Cape Coast. And that is what we want to maintain. Mm -hmm. So that always there will be, this Cape Coast will be, uh, a place where everybody will want to visit. Obviously, the festival is bringing a lot of eyes onto the city. What are you hoping will emerge from that? What sort of sustainable progress are you hoping can stem from this Afashe celebration? Indications that are emerging from, from uh, this festival is that People, especially indigents of Cape Coast, are now waking up to using this festival as a wake-up call for them to come establish businesses in Cape Coast so that the, through them we'll widen our scope. So it's, it's a, it's a wake-up call for everybody to we, we shouldn't wait for the festival alone. We should all help to build Cape Coast to a higher uh, level. Um, let's switch tacks a little bit just before we wrap things up. Um, many people's perception of traditional leadership or traditional rule is that it comes with a lot of spiritualism and idol worship and so forth. Set, set the record straight for us. Uh, how much of that is really involved in what you do? If they say that we don't worship an idol, we are Ghanaians. God planted us here. We have our own way of life. And that is what our ancestors did. And if you really go back and learn from what they did, it put them together. They had a way of solving their own problems. And they lived longer. The food they ate and, and the, the friendship they saw themselves as unique and helped each other. There's no idol worship. In those days, yes, we had a way of communicating with, with the realms around us. Fine, everybody has their. There are Buddhists in, in uh, uh, India. So many people, they, they have their way, own way, indigenous way of communicating with the spirits or the realms above. We had ours. So I don't think we can say, 
uh, we can blacklist the way we were using to, to communicate with our elders. And in fact, with that, burglary, uh, I will put it bluntly that bad atmosphere were not, were, uh, I would say did not happen in those days. 